Did you know that each American, on average, uses 80 to 100 gallons of water a day, with the nation's collective daily water usage topping 345 billion gallons? Enough to sink the state of Rhode Island under a foot of water. Picture this. It would take you 50,000 years to reach that same volume if you were to turn on your garden hose and to let it run continuously. So as our water supply diminishes, our population grows larger day by day. This growth demands water for basic necessities like growing food and maintaining green spaces that are vital for regulating the Earth's temperature and keeping us sane. Because of this, I worry about the legacy that my generation is leaving for my daughter and future generations of children and grandchildren who will have to fight the rising tide of water scarcity on our behalf. As someone who teaches people how to grow plants, in addition to growing them myself, I want to prove to you that we don't have to sacrifice the beauty of our green spaces in order to conserve water for future generations. Most green spaces you can imagine, from your yard, the park, even the college campus, share a common feature. They're swallowed in an ocean of lush green grass. In fact, in the United States, grasses are the largest irrigated crop, taking up three times more land than food staples like corn, wheat, and soybean. Historically, in Florida, public water consumption is second only to agricultural use. And according to a government-backed study published in 2019, 72% of the water used for agricultural and public consumption come from water aquifers that run the length of the state of Florida right below our feet. But what most people don't realize is that their drinking water and the water they're pumping from their wells to irrigate their yards come from the same aquifer in many cases. And by pumping large volumes of fresh water to irrigate our yards, we're slowly moving the boundary between fresh water and salt water inland. This overuse of fresh water is resulting in salt water intrusion, which is contaminating our drinking and public water supplies. So if we know this is happening, how can we stop it? Well, by now, I hope we all realize that we shouldn't leave the water running when we're brushing our teeth, and that we need to be more conscious of the amount of water coming out of our tap. But these are only partial solutions to a growing issue. However, reducing excess irrigation for green spaces could result in huge water savings if we start working together now. As someone who grows plants, I often hear things like, gardening's easy, just plant green side up. Well. In the greenhouse industry where profits are made by selling healthy plants, we have a saying that the person who controls your watering controls your profits. That's because there's this misconception that if your plant isn't growing well, all you have to do is water it and it'll get better. And if a little water is good, then a lot of water must be better. But this is kind of like going to the doctor and walking away with a handful of pills without them asking you about your symptoms. From my experience, we tend to kill more plants because we don't understand how much water they need, which leads to death from overwatering rather than underwatering. So take this misguided way of thinking and scale it up to everyone with a yard, and you quickly see the problem at hand. Now, despite grasses being a highly irrigated crop, they're not what I truly would call a water hog. In fact, many plants have been labeled water hogs, but in truth, who controls the watering? The plants? or the people. So how do you or I know if a yard in Florida is being overwatered without taking any data? We just need to look for one plant. It's called dollarweed, and it has a silver dollar-shaped leaf. I see it growing in many yards in my neighborhood, and I hate to say it, even growing at the, at the research center where I work. It's frustrating for me when I see this plant because it's, a, it, it's frustrating because dollarweed is it's frustrating when I see it growing in the grass, sorry, because why? Dollar weed is an aquatic plant. And when I see it growing in a terrestrial yard, it's a clear indication of overwatering and a wasteful practice. It's hard for me to see this plant because I understand how much water is being wasted that could have been saved. So 
maybe you're still not convinced that we're overwatering our yards. So let me try to convince you another way. First, let's define the term evapotranspiration. Evaporation is the loss of water from surfaces. Water changes from a liquid to a gas. Transpiration is the loss of water from plants. Again, a liquid to a gas. To imagine this better, picture standing outside on a hot, humid, sticky summer day in Florida, and a magical breeze comes along, and you instantly feel cooled. That's because the water on your skin pulls heat away from your body as it evaporates into the air. Now take that same breeze on a winter's day, and you're often left feeling chilled with chapped lips and dry skin. Not quite so magical, but the same principle applies. So we have evaporation and transpiration. Put them together and you have evapotranspiration, or ET, which serves as a cooling mechanism for plants and the planet. Again, test it for yourself. Go outside on that hot sunny day and stand on asphalt or artificial grass and then stand on real grass and you'll immediately feel the temperature difference. ET is a metric. It measures the total amount of water lost from the soil and from plants. And it should equal the amount of water that's being applied. For example, if you lost one inch of water, you apply one inch of water. So to help this sink in, let's look at the estimated ET values in Florida for the months of January and June. In January, we lost a total of 0.05 inches of water. And in June, we lost a total of 0.16 inches of water. Contrast this with the amount of rain that fell. Typically in January, we get anywhere from three to five inches of rain. And in June, our rainy season, we get five to eight inches of rain. So clearly rainfall outpaces ET. So you might be thinking, well, of course, this is Florida where it rains cats and dogs year round. Okay, okay, well, let's look at the data for Illinois. In January, we lost 0.02 inches of water. And in January or June, we lost 0.16 inches. And again, rainfall outpaces ET with one to two inches of rain in the winter and two to three inches of rain in the summer. Now, I should point out that these are historical values that have remained consistent for the last three years. So, if rainfall outpaces ET, are we wasting water when we irrigate our yards on top of monthly rainfall? Well, if you are watering your yard while it's raining, then yes, you are wasting water. But, what if it's been a couple weeks since it rained? Well, again, the answer is yes, you are probably wasting water. That's because we get more than enough rain to satisfy the needs of most established landscapes. In fact, most established landscapes don't need any additional irrigation, especially those that are a good balance of trees, shrubs, ornamentals, and grass. Think about the plants in your own yard, or in a park, or on the college campus. Many of them are older than me, they don't need any additional irrigation. Now, there are some exceptions. Contrary to established landscapes, newly planted shrubs and trees do require irrigation to get them going and growing. But this doesn't mean you have to turn on your sprinkler system. Because in many cases, the sprinklers are watering the air, the sides of the building, the sidewalk, and not the plant roots. Based on the research generated from our, based on the data generated from our research group, we know that most shrubs will be established in three to five months with about three liters of water applied every other day. That's about a gallon of water or a count of three from a garden hose. Trees will take a little bit longer, maybe six to 12 months to establish, and about five to 10 liters. So, by now, I hope that I have convinced you that we, the people, are abusing our water resources and not our plants. Preventing wasteful irrigation doesn't mean that you have to look up ET every time it, you want to irrigate your yard, or buy a fancy irrigation system, or even advocating against planting green spaces. No, as discussed, we get more than enough rain to satisfy what's been lost. But what we do need to do, 
is we need to start to work together to blend this information with other water conscious behaviors to reduce overall water use because there is no silver bullet. And we should be encouraged to plant our vegetable gardens and our flower gardens. But when we do, we should want to water them by hand because that's the fun part of gardening. Getting out your watering can and painting your flowers with water and watching them grow and flourish. But let your plants dictate when they need to be watered based on when they show signs that they need it. Grass blades will start to curl. Leaves will wilt and turn yellow. Those are indications that your plants need water. But if you haven't let the soil dry out between irrigation events, drooping and yellowing leaves also are signs of overwatering. Bottom line, we can turn our sprinkler systems off and only water when our plants show signs that they need it. And as stewards of future mankind, we have an obligation to look for wasteful irrigation practices in our neighborhoods, our communities, and on our college campuses. If we see wasteful irrigation happening, someone's watering the air, someone's watering the sidewalk, someone's watering the side of a building, or someone's watering while it's raining, we need to speak up. We need to say something. I have a habit of talking to all of my neighbors about their irrigation practices. I also try to set an example by turning off my sprinklers, watering only when my plants need it, and watering things by hand. My husband would love to water our lawn more often, but I won't let him. That's because I want to make sure that I do my part to ensure that there will be enough water for future generations to drink, to grow food, and to live. I challenge you to do the same thing. Help me spread the word. Let's turn our sprinkler systems off because every drop counts. Thank you.